guys, welcome back to main sequence stars this time. So have your HR diagram out in front of you so that we can talk about those main sequence stars. So let's talk about main sequence stars, guys. Now, as we've talked, you know that main sequence lines means we're converting hydrogen into helium. And we're certainly going to talk about protostars next, because a protostar is something that will eventually become a star. And we define a protostar becoming a star when it's reached the required temperatures in its core, basically, to go ahead and start converting hydrogen into helium. And remember, it's doing that through those thermonuclear reactions. And we talked about that within our sun. And we'll talk about more of those reactions as that star starts evolving off that main sequence line. We also have talked about this and the fact that during the entire lifetime of that star, you know, you're going to have what's going on within gravitational coll collapse, pulling it inward, that radiation pressure outward, trying to push it out. When it's two or even equilibrium we talk about, hydrostatic equilibrium, but they're continuing. I mean, even a little bit is going to cause our, that star to go ahead and expand and contract. And we do know our sun's doing that. We've certainly seen evidence of that that it's doing that expansion and contraction, but it's not a huge amount. Not like what we're going to see as we start talking about the evolutionary sequence of these stars. So, as I said, those stars on the main sequence are undergoing that thermonuclear reaction. They are converting hydrogen into helium. We've also said the star is going to spend 90% of its lifetime as a main sequence line. So what does that mean and what temperature, or excuse me, what temperatures, what times are we really talking about? Also remember, guys, we talked about O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. O, be a fine girl, kiss me. Or if you're a girl, O, be a fine guy and kiss me. Okay, and so that gives you the order of the types or the spectral classifications. And so you can see on this chart, I have lifetimes, I have type, I have the mass, and I have the time on this 0 AMS. What is that? Well, 0 AMS stands for zero age main sequence. It's just another way that astronomers like to refer to that line as that main sequence line they put on, say, a zero age. So look, if I'm talking about a star that's an O-type star, it's really, really, really very large, very hot. You know, its mass is at least 40 times the mass of our sun. Then notice the time that it's going to spend converting hydrogen to helium is only one million years. Now, guys, that's nothing more than a, you know, basically a snapshot when we are talking about times relative to the universe. I mean, our universe has been around almost 14 billion years. You know, that's a tiny amount of time. You know, as that star then, if that O-type star was 50 times the mass of the sun, then it's even going to be less than a million years. I'm sure you guys have all heard the expression that the, you know, larger they are, the faster they fall. Well, that's definitely true when we talk about stars. B-type star, 16 mass, so it's 16 times larger than the sun. It's going to be around about 10 million years. That's still not real long. I mean, 10 million years, again, is a tiny amount when we talk about the age of the universe. An A0 star, it's about 3.3 times the mass of the sun. It's going to be here about 500 million. And then it's going to start evolving off the main sequence line. Now, when I say evolve off the main sequence line, guys, realize that I, it has nothing to do with where that star is in the actual position in the sky. It just means that if I plot those two characteristics, looking at temperature or spectral classifications and looking at luminosity or brightness, then things are changing. They are no longer on that main sequence line. And then if I look at an F0, I'm looking at 1.7 times the mass of the sun. Notice how long it's going to spend on the main sequence line. 2.7 billion years. And yes, that is a billion with a B. So I've gone from 3.3 times the mass of our sun to 1.7 times the mass of our sun. And I've increased the time on the main sequence from 500 million years to about 2.7 billion years. If I go down to a G-type star, G0, so it's a 1.1. Notice that that's 9 billion. Remember we're a G2 star, 
So we're basically our mass, and we're going to spend right around 10 b million, excuse me, 10 billion years on the main sequence line. I get to those K0 stars, it's about 80% the size of our sun. Notice it's going to be on there for 14 billion. So we really haven't been around quite long enough to see a K0 star evolve off of the main sequence line. So you're down into that red dwarf region, an M0, about 40% the size of our sun, 200 billion years. Well, guys, like I said, we've only been around not quite 14 billion years. And these lifetimes on the main sequence line for these red dwarfs are in the orders of 200 billion. So we haven't even approached being around long enough to see one of those red dwarfs cool off and fade, out of, fade away. So, like I said, low-mass stars are simply defined as stars that are certainly smaller than our sun. And then I've alluded to these brown dwarfs, but want to go ahead and give you a definition at this point. And they're very low-mass stars. And again, when I say very, I mean really low-mass, that are less than about 0.08 solar masses, and they're never going to be able to you know, reach the temperatures in their core that's going to be required to convert hydrogen into helium. And so they've got to then, they are brown dwarf stars, then there's got to be some other mechanism inside there that's providing the energy for them to go ahead and be seen, to go ahead and shine. And we think that that's probably from gravitational collapse. Think back when you're fourth or fifth or sixth grade and you talked about kinetic energy as energy of motion and potential energy as stored energy. Well, guys, we're doing the same kind of potential and kinetic here. You go ahead and you compress or collapse that star, and as that material is going from an area of higher potential to a lower potential, then I get energy converted into kinetic. Remember the law of conservation of mass and energy. Energy and mass can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only change forms. And so, you know, this mechanism then, going from that potential to kinetic, is what's causing those stars to shine. The star is going to go ahead and continue to collapse until we get to something called electron degeneracy. And that's going to support the weight of the rest of the star. And then, like I said, it's just going to basically slowly cool off and fade away. Now, let's talk about what we mean by that electron degenerate star. That just means, guys, that I no longer have other kinds of particles. Everything has been converted into electrons, basically. And the electrons, which are negatively charged particles, the core will go ahead and collapse to the point that everything is electrons. And therefore, I can't get any closer at that point. So the rest of the weight of the star basically gets stopped from collapsing anymore on the core because the core is made up of electrons, and all those electrons are negatively charged, and so you get a repulsion effect in there. And then, like I said, they're just going to slowly fade away. And these red dwarfs, then, we've talked about a little bit. You know, Now we're going back up, and we will eventually get back up to the stars that are very large. They go ahead and form big convection currents within the layers of the stars. And so then you look at the heat that's being distributed to the star from those big convection currents as compared to then what was going within our sun. You know, you had the core and you had the radiation zone and then you had the big convection zone. Well, these red dwarfs are never going to do that. They're never going to be able to set up those layers. Okay. Like I said, these big convection currents are going ahead and take that energy away, and the star goes ahead and gradually cools off. We think that then once that core is no longer producing energy, gravity, as with every other star, is going to take over, causes the star to go ahead and contract, and that becomes a white dwarf. White dwarfs, remember, were on the lower left hand. They are very bright very hot, excuse me, they're very hot, but they're very dim. And so they're also going to do the same thing. They're eventually going to go ahead and cool off and fade away. So we know those smaller mass stars are ultimately going to cool off and fade away. The only difference is with what's going on within the star itself and the mechanism that finally then goes ahead and provides that final energy that then the star goes ahead and cools off. And certainly, as I have said, and I will say again, that mass makes that really big difference. 
And so mass determines what's going on inside that star. Now medium-sized stars or medium-mass stars, as I showed you on that little table, are stars between about 0.4 and 3 solar masses. So really these stars are very close to the sun and are in the size. And within the core, they've reached temperatures in the millions of degrees Kelvin. They, on the other hand, unlike the brown dwarfs and the red dwarfs, are going to undergo some additional fusion reactions. And they're going to go ahead and convert hydrogen into helium. And you know that's going to continue until you kind of run out of hydrogen. You have some helium left. And then we're going to find they go through the helium burning stage. So they're actually going to go through more stages within their core than what the brown dwarfs and the red dwarfs do. You've seen this before, you know, looking at that proton-proton chain. Same kind of thing that's going on in the sun, so we're not going to worry about that too much. Because you've seen it before and we've talked about it. Just kind of want to remind you as we go ahead and start talking about these stars and their evolutionary sequence that atomic number is a number of protons, atomic mass number, number of protons plus neutrons. Remember, guys, as we continue looking at these reactions, you have electrons, you have positrons, which are positive electrons. You have neutrinos, which are essentially massless, chargeless particles that go ahead and help carry away all this, about 3% of the total amount of energy. We have gamma radiation, which is what you see that really goes ahead and powers those stars. And that proton is also known as a hydrogen nucleus, which has an atomic number of one. All I'm doing is just kind of reminding you some of these terms so that when we start talking about what's going on, you can remember and refer to these. We've also talked about E equals MC squared, so I'm not going to go over that. We've also talked about this one, just to, again, to remind you how much energy these stars are using and how much mass they're having to convert into that energy, according to Einstein's equation. Now, for larger stars, they can't quite use that proton-proton chain. You know, we have those two steps that produce the neutrinos. We have those two steps that go ahead and produce the gamma radiation. But that's not enough to go ahead and fuel these really, really, really big stars. If any of you have children, think about you've got a kid out there that's playing football. He's a really big, stocky kid. You know, there's a good chance that he's going to clean out your refrigerator. I mean, when my nephew was growing up and he would come up and visit me, and he's a pretty good-sized guy, um, <laughs> I couldn't keep enough food in my refrigerator, you know? So they're going to need lots and lots and lots of energy. You know? No matter what size they are, they're simply using a tremendous amount of energy. And so we've got to come up with another mechanism to go ahead and be able to look at producing this energy. And so we do that with a carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen cycle. So let's look at these steps. We've already gone through that proton, proton, so a lot of these um, particles and those kinds of things should be familiar with you then. So we start with hydrogen now, and we add that to carbon. And carbon has six protons, six protons and six neutrons. And notice we're going to convert that into nitrogen seven. So nitrogen seven has seven protons. And you can see there how many neutrons. But more importantly, we're getting gamma radiation given off. Remember that gamma radiation is nothing more than pure energy, and that's going to help support that star. Then in step two, we take our nitrogen. It's unstable, so it immediately gets converted to carbon-13. Notice, not carbon-12. Carbon-13. We have a neutrino given, or positron given off, and we have a neutrino given off. That neutrino, remember, is also energy. Not as much as what you're going to have in a gamma ray, but certainly it is energy. And remember that gammas are actual just electromagnetic radiation, whereas a neutrino is an actual particle. Step three, you're going to take that hydrogen, that proton. This time you're going to react it with the isotope carbon-13. You're going to produce nitrogen-14, which means I now have seven protons and seven neutrons, and I'm going to get another gamma radiation out, another gamma ray. Step four, 
take a hydrogen proton, add carbon-7 to it, excuse me, add nitrogen-7 to it, and you're going to form now oxygen. Okay, hence the name, guys, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So you knew we had to have some oxygen eventually getting in there. And so I form oxygen-15. Most of the oxygen that we see out there is oxygen-16. has eight protons and eight neutrons. This has one less neutron. And so we find out that because of that one less neutron, it's unstable, and it's going to go ahead and revert back to a more stable version, and that's what's going to happen in step five. Okay. So then you also notice that you have gamma radiation given off. Okay, so we've got that oxygen-15 goes back down to nitrogen-15. So I've lost a proton. I've gained a neutron. I give off a positron, and I give off another neutrino. And then step six doesn't give off any energy, but it does go ahead and give me more carbon so I can start my cycle all the way over again. So there's a proton, plus now I'm adding nitrogen-15, that gets converted into carbon-12, which is certainly stable, plus then what's called an alpha particle. But an alpha particle is nothing more than a helium nucleus. And so it's that helium without the electrons. And as I've said before, it's extremely stable. So we're still converting hydrogen into helium. It's just in those larger stars within the core, I have other materials besides just hydrogen and helium. And so I need those other materials to go ahead and give me enough energy that's produced in this cycle to power the star. And so if you look, you've got essentially five steps that are producing energy. Three steps are producing gamma radiation, and then two steps are producing neutrinos. And then on step six, I get my carbon-12 again, which will allow me to start all over. So I'm, again, converting hydrogen into helium just through a different mechanism. Do I expect you to ever have memorized a proton-proton chain or the carbon-nitrogen-oxygen chain? No. But I do expect you, if you would see it again, to be able to use it and to understand what it's telling you. Like I said, both the proton-proton and the carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle will go ahead and convert, sorry about that, guys, four hydrogen nuclei into helium. So, like I said, they're basically doing the same thing, just through different mechanisms. Now, eventually, most of that hydrogen is going to have been converted into helium, and so when that happens, obviously things are going to start running down. And if we're talking about those really large stars, you're going to have lots of helium in the core, and you're also going to have whatever other materials you might have had there to start with. So we're going to get this hydrogen burning that's going to stop. But I haven't got the high temperatures yet required to go ahead and fuse helium. So what's going to happen if my hydrogen burning, that fusion process, goes ahead and slows, I'm no longer in hydrostatic equilibrium, so therefore the core itself is going to start contracting. Gravity is going to take over and cause the core to, cor to uh, contract. Well, guys, as the core contra contracts, the rest of the star recognizes that and kind of contracts along with it. And so that's why you're going to get kind of an instability region for just a little bit until everything gets readjusted and that star can, can start burning helium. So, like I said, during this time, that chemical composition has changed, you know, depending on what I have to start with. And so when that energy slows or energy production slows or in some cases can almost stop, that core is going to start collapsing. And when that core collapses, then that's going to cause the star's luminosity, size, everything that's going on in the interior to go ahead and be altered. And that's then when we start having that star move off from the main sequence line to the various regions above that main sequence line. And as we've talked, what a star does next is going to depend upon that initial mass. Mass is the single most important determining factor when you look at the evolutionary sequence of that star. Now, gradually then, 
as you're looking at that main sequence star over time, you are slowly, and I do mean slowly, running out of that hydrogen. And so the rest of the core itself will go ahead and expand, excuse me, the rest of the core will go ahead and contract to allow for the fact that you are gradually slowing those reactions. And so if we look at our sun, we know our sun is brighter now than it was in the past. Past, it was about 70% of what we see it now. And it's because as the hydrogen is slowly, slowly stopping, to, you know, or at least slowing down, the rest of that core is going to respond to that. It's going to start condensing down a little bit to produce a little bit more of that energy that's given off, which is ultimately going to cause the star to become a little bit brighter. And so you've got those kinds of reactions that are going on within the core itself that will gradually change over the period of time that it's on the HR diagram, excuse me, on the main sequence line. But still, guys, ultimately remember, the star on a main sequence line is converting hydrogen into helium. Now, once it stops converting hydrogen to helium, then depending on its mass, we'll determine what's going on next. Okay, and that's what I want to talk about then next is taking, okay, let's go back and let's look at these stars on the main sequence line. Let's break them up according to their mass. So we'll talk about these really massive stars. We'll talk about large stars. We'll talk about medium stars. We'll talk about the small stars. We'll talk about how they evolve off the main sequence line and how they ultimately end their life. And so like I said, guys, notice the last couple of sessions, we haven't had any really cool pictures. That's because when we come in next time, what I want to do is go back, start talking about a protostar. No text this time, guys. I just want to take you on a nice visual journey from the protostars all the way to black holes for those really, really, really large, massive stars. So make sure between now and the next time, you go ahead and go to Blackboard, pull off the sequences that I have for you on there that talk about the evolution of the stars. And I want that notes, those notes basically to be in front of you as we go ahead and go through that entire sequence from a protostar to the end cycle of every one of those different mass stars. Okay? So with that, guys, I'll plan on seeing you next time and be prepared for a journey out to the outer reaches of our solar system and beyond. So with that, talk to you later.